Hello, my friends. Welcome to New Kids with a Shop, brought to you by the Arcade Comics Collectibles and Games, located in a blustery and titanically wet Fort Wayne, Indiana. I am Matt Cade. <laughs> and I'm Craig Ray. This episode is called Flash Mob. I'm just following a. Uh, societal clues because everybody else is picking on them because they, they're, ri they're rich they don't yeah. have any rights to you know and you die doing something stupid <laughs> welcome back everybody to you new don't, kids you don't with do the something shop. like that without consulting mr cameron that is on them that's true this episode is you want to start over not at all <laughs> start off. i think it's gold all right we'll keep it so this episode is called Flash Mob. Uh, we're going to be discussing a few things as far as current events, and we're going to end the meeting. Uh, we have yet to do an episode to discuss uh, the passing of legend John Ramita Sr. We have uh, Richard Shoup, Rick, as you all know him, with us today. He's going to say a few things. We're all going to discuss uh, Ramita Sr. Uh, we've got Shane Pace. Hey, everybody. We're going to discuss our experience with The Flash, and then we're going to end this up with some uh, exciting projects, uh, upcoming projects, and kind of go over the solicitations and timelines and things like that and tell you about the books we're excited about. So uh, first... Past, present, and future is what we're doing this week appropriately. So. Yes, yes, yes. So first things first uh, with John Romita. You, want to, you just want to go for it? Rick, you want me to give some uh, stats? He, and he, was, like he was born on uh, the 24th of January, 1930. Uh, he passed away on the 12th of this month. Um, he was born in New York City and... Brooklyn. Yeah. In 1949, he, uh, he started as a ghost artist for Timely Comics. And then in 51, he moved over to drawing horror, ro uh, horror war, and romance for Atlas, formerly Timely. And then in 1958, he went to D.C., where he stayed until 65, and then... <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Cut that part out. Yeah. <coughs> where, he, uh, where he joined Marvel, and that's where all the memories were made for me anyway. Yeah. That cut through a lot of good stuff for me that I grew up with, but uh, that is the highlights for sure. He was, what, 93? Mm-hmm. You got to think, in, in the whole history of comic runs, that was one of the best. 93 years. Uh, Hall of Fame. He was inducted into Hall of Fame in 2002 for the Eisner Awards. Is also notable, but I mean, walk through it, Rick. I mean, this—that's just. Yeah, I've been waiting you know, to hear what, what Rick's got to say about it. That's just the Wikipedia. I mean, I used to read uh, <laughs> some of the fanzines. The Comic Reader and Alter Ego were common ones when I was an uh, early comic fan, and um, like a teen comic fan. And uh, John talked about his early life a couple of times in there. I think once with Roy Thomas. And uh, the way I remember him uh, getting his start, he said he was five years old. He went down to the newsstand and was looking at all the artwork and the comics, and he picked up an issue of Superman, and he really liked what he saw. So he bought two of them, and he brought them home, and he kept one as part of his new collection. And the other one he used as a uh, artistic guide to help him, help him learn how to he draw could. figures. And hmm. it was a, a, a start for him that really made all the difference in him wanting to draw comics. And then after a short time, he fell on to Captain America and saw Jack Kirby's early work with Joe Simon. And this was a big influence from him wanting to uh, do action heroes and maybe work for that company, which I think we all think about Timely, then turning Atlas, then turning Marvel. But there was a nebulous time there where he said the company almost didn't have like a public name. It was uh, like they had a lot of financial difficulties and organizational problems. And so it, whether or not it was Timely or Atlas or if it had no name at all, he uh, had a friend. Well, actually, he went to uh, – after high school, he went to an um, art and design school. And then when he got out, he got hired at a lithograph company in the New York area. And uh, he ran across one of his old high school buddies while he was working for the lith lithograph company. And this guy's name was Lester Zakarin. And uh, he said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm working for what was presumably Timely Comics then. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's tough. He said, I'm having a hard time with my deadlines and stuff. And he said, I know you're an artist. He said, can you help me? And John was you know, excited because of this interest in the Superman and Captain America early issues he'd had. So, yeah, he said, I'll help you. And so what the guy talked him into was kind of not fair. He had John do all the layouts. Mm -hmm. And then he just inked it and turned it in and said it was his work. And he did that for a year and a half. 
And then in the meantime, John got drafted, and he was uh, in the Army, and he was stationed in the New York area. And, and all of a sudden, magically, that guy wasn't making his, uh, his yeah, deadlines yeah, anymore. Suddenly. Yeah, <laughs> And so he, in uniform, when he uh, got out of the military, it was like his last week or whatever, he went to the Timely offices or the Atlas offices, and he went in and talked to Flo Steinberg, Stan's uh, mm -hmm. secretary, and he said, listen, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I've been working for you guys for about a year and a half, and I'm wondering, can I get a job? And she said, this is an interesting story. Let me get Stan. And she got Stan, and he came out front, and the guy told him the story, and Stan said, here's a script. I'm restarting Captain America. So from 1953 to 1955, or 54, a year, he worked on Captain America as the new revival of Captain America, which mm -hmm. didn't work at that time. Sales were down, and, you know, and the interest in the superheroes was waning. So they were actually going through a bankruptcy a reorganization, mm -hmm. and that's when he headed for D.C. Yeah, because he'd done all the romance himself. comics and stuff, right? And he was known for being able to draw attractive faces. Yeah, and DC, uh, he made a real close friend with Robert Kaniger, who was the creator of Sergeant Rock and used to write Hawkman and a few other characters. Uh, but Robert was over the romance books, which were right. booming at the time. Young sure. girls mm -hmm. had, you know, Chatty Cathy dolls and, and comic books. That and, Kirby was doing them right too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the guys started there, but uh, but uh, Robert saw the potential and and hired him. To uh, do uh, young, let's see, girls love. Let's see, wait, I've got it written down here because I wanted to remember this specifically. Uh, young love, girls love stories, and secret hearts. And I distinctly remember my sister having some of those books. Oh, yeah, and they were everything that you've said so far. Everything has been off the dome, everybody. Everything's been extemporaneous, but those three things you had to look up. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, for some reason, I remember Millie the model and those kind of things from Marvel because I'm a little older and. Uh, Patsy and Hetty, but uh, the DC books my sister had. And he did those, I think, like uh, Matt said, for about eight years. And there was an interesting little DC thing that happened because Kaniger was also writing the Silver Age Wonder Woman. He took over that character and had hired Ross Andrew and, and Mike Esposito to do the artwork. They weren't real confident about that because they had done like military books and horror books, and, and they were worried they were not going to be able, able to draw a beautiful Wonder Woman, which would be a big draw for that book. Yeah, for sure. So after they discussed it a little bit, Ross was a little reticent, but uh, Mike went to uh, Kaniger and said, could we talk to John? And he made arrangements for them to talk to John. He said, do you think you'd come in and touch up the Wonder Woman faces for us? Because your women are beautiful. And he said, listen, I appreciate that. He was a very humble guy. John Reed was very humble. And he also maybe wasn't confident in himself 100%. Because he said, I just don't know. I'm very slow. And he said, I don't know if I have time to do my work and then also come over and touch up that stuff. He said, you guys are great. You'll do a good job. It'll be fine. Uh, I appreciate you asking, but I, I just can't do it. So he didn't get involved with that. Oh. And it's a shame because if you were looking at those old Wonder Woman's, Mike, Ross did, or, uh, yeah, Ross did have a little bit of trouble with some of the faces. Mm. It was still pretty, but, it, it, you know, John's so well known for drawing beautiful women. If you look at his Mary Jane Watson reveal yep. mm. in Amazing Spider-Man, it's one of the most beautiful first appearances of a female well, character I, ever. I, I was just going to say, and I'm going to jump up real quick and we'll go back, but I, I always remember him coming on to the Spider-Man book. That's when Peter Parker got kind of good looking, mm -hmm. whereas he was... A gawky teenager, and then oh, now he's kind of handsome because right. he was just used to writing. And Stan warned him about that. Actually, if you ever, I don't know, in the interview, he mentioned that Steve had had a very he's a dark look at life, and mm -hmm. he made Peter very frail and that uh, and maybe not very handsome because they wanted to be all about the accident that changed him. It wasn't he wasn't anyone special before that. The accident changed him. Just a teenage as, kid. Yeah, just an average teenage kid. And when John started drawing, he can't help himself. He's not someone who draws dark alleys and, you know, shaded uh, crime scenes. Mm -hmm. He draws very broad, light of day kind of scenes, and he makes people muscular and good looking. Good looking. And yep. so there, his reasoning was, well, he started out as this frail guy, but he's been climbing walls and leaping across buildings. His body has developed and gotten more muscular, yep. and so my drawing is reflecting him you know, maturing and being more physical. And, and, so. and like you said, the legacy of uh, his of Mary Mary Jane being just a bombshell. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Mary Jane and the old Dicko ones just had a scarf on a lot of times. You couldn't even see her face. They purposely kept her secret. She, she was no Gwen Stacy then. Yeah, you just saw like the, the back of her or yeah. she'd be off panel. She always missed Peter. Yeah, and, yeah. And then when he decided to have the reveal, I, of course, 
couldn't have picked a better artist. He, his Gwen Stacy, too, is very beautiful. Mm-hmm. And his MJ scene with her in that black sleeveless top answering the door and saying, face front, or face a tiger, you've just hit the jackpot. Just hit the That's jackpot. the most incredible you know, scene from Amazing Spider-Man. Which, probably shameless ever. plug, they just, re- uh, they just released that as a Funko Pop, oh. which I just ordered. So it's the actual... The panel? It is that panel. It's her saying, face it, tiger, you hit the jackpot. So Terrific. it's got like... It's even got like the uh, the bubble and everything with That's it. awesome. So I'm pretty excited about that one because I showed... Well, I was we were talking earlier about the Gwen Stacy one. I actually did get the Mary Jane one from last week because that one was awesome with the uh, bubble panel. I just... Sorry. Wow. I'm just letting people know that if you're looking for that or if, that, if you appreciate Sounds that great. iconic... Uh, reveal as much as us they're actually doing it in the funko form which is kind of neat so and i'm sorry i didn't mean to get you out of the 50s there for a second sorry no i, I don't know if there. anyone's interested in this i stuff. think we no, all me. are this is this is where great. i started and that's all i know no it's and, awesome but after uh after the romance comic boom started slowing down a little bit um he starts reaching out and seeing what else was out there he was thinking about going into advertising which is kind of where he was trained in the first place and stan saw an opportunity and said we could use you over here. I've got a character called Daredevil that uh, Wally Wood has <laughs> yes. stopped drawing, and Wally did some. Wally perfected him. Yeah, yeah. Some ultimately beautiful issues. But he was leaving and going to Tower and doing Thunder Agents and so on. And so he asked John if he would come over and do Daredevil. And if he only did Daredevil for a year, like eight issues of a, a bi monthly or whatever. But he but, speaks about it very, very. Like, he yes. loved drawing, doing Daredevil. Loved drawing. Yeah. And he didn't really want to leave it when it became time for him to replace Ditko. But, but he, one of the great things he invented that I still to this day love is his uh, creation of the villain, the gladiator, with the spinning <laughs> blades on his wrists. Mm-hmm. That is one of the coolest villains ever back in that time anyways. Mm-hmm. Maybe he doesn't, isn't the same as uh, his modern times. But back then, that was a very cool villain. And Daredevil had a couple of encounters with him. He's up there with Stilt Man. For me, definitely. That was a uh, Wally Wood, right? Yeah. Originally. Although John did also cover Stiltman Battle. You gotta have a you gotta have Stiltman in there. So apparently, uh, you know, Dick Cohen Leaf had a falling out and uh and since he was leaving abruptly, uh Stan said you would be perfect to go over. He had actually had Daredevil battle Spider Man in two issues mm-hmm. through a misunderstanding. Beginning a long history of those two. So that's why he knew he could draw Spider Man because he'd already done it twice in the Daredevil comics, so he pulled him over and Starting with number 39 and Amazing, he had him take over Spider-Man for five years. Yep. And created, I wanted to mention, or helped co-designed. It also made it, it was going, it went from Marvel's number two book to the number one book at that point. Huh. Uh, really important characters. Like, uh, he defined what Mary, Mary Jane Watson looked like because she'd always been in the shadows for Ditko. But he added uh, Gwen Stacy, uh, Captain George Stacy, her police uh, captain father, uh, he designed the Kingpin, one of the major villains of all of Marvel. Yeah. He designed the Rhino, uh, which has not been treated well in the films, but is a great comic villain. Yep. The Shocker was my favorite. This the guy Shocker. had a, his costume had a, like padding in, you know, in a vest so he could withstand the uh, vibrations he was sending out. And he had these great watch uh, top t- kind of uh, dials on his uh, thumb that he, or in his uh, Forefinger that he could push that would send the vibrations to Spider Man and you know knock him off the wall or whatever. It was just one of the coolest villains. I, I absolutely loved the look of the villain and his costume fit him perfectly. It was designed beautifully. More than uh, Electro? Well, Ditko's Electro is pretty important to me. Yeah, that's cool. But I, I, you know what? I think maybe the Shocker might be a little Boy. better. Shocker's aw- I thought Shocker's design was always awesome too because they, as I've grown older, <laughs> And I like replace the actual filters in my air conditioning units at home, and it's got like that weird crisscross like wire. Yes, me- yes, yes. It kind of looked it like that like a little bit. Vest, like, yeah. It was the same type of thing, and it was so cool to like growing up. And the, I thought it was a bold move making it that gross like gray poupon and brown colored like you'd never seen no, but like yeah, that nothing looked before. like that. It was very uh, exciting and yeah, you know, popped. popped yeah, it was cool. Like, uh, he also uh, co-designed the original Hobgoblin. Uh, he got with Jerry Conley when Jerry took over the writing from uh, Roy and Stan and kind of fine-tuned the Punisher's costume. Mm-hmm. Jerry definitely had the skull and, and the idea of the Punisher, but he made that skull and the belt and everything If you all fit see the before perfectly. and after, it's, it's like Romita made him. He made a big deal. Um, as a matter of fact, Stan made him uh, the art director for the entire company from 73 to 83. So that shows you why he was so Was the um, How to Draw respected. Art, uh, How to Draw Comics Marvel Way, was that? That was Buscema and Stan, if I remember right. Um, hey, John. 
He designed Luke Cage with the slave yes. chain around well, he, him. Yeah, My he, favorite design. And the, and the wristband. He said he, he regretted that, though. He put too much slave iconography yeah. on it. But at the time, it popped again, just like yeah. the shocker. It looks so cool. It was the coolest thing, and he looked like the toughest guy mm-hmm. you know, ever. He designed Brother Voodoo, which is <laughs> like, that's strange awesome. but cool yep. character. He designed Bullseye, one of Daredevil's enemies. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and uh, Tigra, one of the West Coast Tigra. Avengers. That were that. She's coming that back. Time. And he's the one that designed uh, Monica Rambeau's appearance in 1982 as C- Captain Marvel, but she was the first ca- the, one of the replacement Captain Marvels. Mm-hmm. He uh, five years after her creation by Don Heck and Stan and uh, Stanley, he revised the Black Widow's costume so it was less of a uh, dress clothes and more of a spy suit with the, the, the necklace Made and more the sense. belt that matched in the web or mm-hmm. the uh, yeah he did the the the, gaunt, the wrist, uh, the wrist gaunt, bracers. Yeah. Uh, he did uh, a revision for Wolverine from Dave Cockrum's original design, so that's very important. He did the skull-capped vulture, which was five years after Ditko created the vulture. He decided he wanted to get away from the older man and make a younger adversary, and mm. so he designed that vulture. A lot of the design changes Not between always. 70s and 80s were all his influence, at least, right? As far as when he became the art from director. The, yeah, and stuff. from 73 Also, to do, you remember, do, you know, do you remember who uh, Mary Jane was based off of? I don't know if I remember that. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Anne Margaret. Yep, Anne Margaret. What was the movie? It was, it was she was the redhead in that Beautiful. movie too. Yep. Bye bye Birdie. Uh, that might have been it. Yeah, but that I mean, was. That I would was, have to look that up, but I remember it was. Uh, I think it was. I'd read, but it was Anne Margaret when she was a redhead, and that's what. That's where that came oh, from. Oh, she's beautiful. That was a good pick. Her and Viva Las Vegas. Ooh. Viva Las Vegas. That's where oh, I mean, remember yeah. from. Um, he did one thing. He did do that wasn't my favorite. Is he kind of made Doc Ock less of a scientist and more of a spandex wearing guy? That was his one design mistake. If I have to pick mm-hmm. one thing about John that I'm disappointed by, that was. And they carried that costume on Doc Ock for many years, which hey. was very. Uh, 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 Batten 990 isn't too bad either. But he uh, designed Peter Parker's parents when they were finally introduced in the annual number five, Richard mm-hmm. and Mary Parker. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and like I say, I have an Aunt Such May, a cool too, name. so that's, I really have always been into Spider-Man. Okay. It didn't hurt okay. that his dad's name was Richard and his aunt was the same as mine. Um, and then um, the Prowler, Hobie Brown. The Prowler. Yep. The window washer from the Daily Bugle. Who do you think became... he'll ever be anything? Mm, nah. We'll see. So do, you, I, do you know who he is, by the way? Modern times? I don't know. So they, he's having a moment right now. Yeah, having a research. They made him Spider Punk in the Across the Universe. Like Hobie Brown the film? is mm-hmm. yeah. In the film. Oh, that's so. And cool. he's getting fans now. It's cool. It's very cool to oh, see. Oh, he's a great character. Cool and his the Prowler first appearance has on, been on the hot list for the past month. It's it was, awesome. It was a very poignant uh, time in comics where they were trying to reach a different audience, and that they had him show, uh, suffer some racism in the comic. Yeah, that they had to show him rising above that. Right. Uh, it was great. That storyline was. Uh, very special back at that time. It was subtle, but I mean, these days it would seem like nothing. But back then, it was incredible to see something like that addressed in the comics. Was Ramita doing Daredevil when uh, they had the um, the uh, black um, veteran that came came back and was going Jean blind? Colin, maybe. Sajin Colon. Okay, I'm not positive. But around the time, yeah, and then they, they uh, uh, had to had to rehabilitate him and yeah, overcome that. Sure it was Jean. a lot of social not conscious a great stuff artist, in the, uh, not the one. Okay. Uh, what else? Did I, well, I did these covers that people are very familiar with from Spider-Man. When you think about Spider-Man, you think about Norman Osborn reading revealed as the Green Goblin mm-hmm. and dragging Peter on a rope over the city, you know, <laughs> yeah. maskless. That was John. Uh, he did the uh, Spider-Man where he quits and throws his costume Spider-Man in the trash no more, can and walks no away. And the cover with him walking down the street in the big red Spider-Man. Yeah. Uh, facsimile next week, Matt? Yeah. 122? Yeah. So there's the... The oh, actual that. book that you're talking about, 122, that Green Goblin cover, they're doing the facsimile. It's it's going to be out this upcoming week. So listening to it, listening to us on Monday, Wednesday after listening to this, it will be. Yep, you can get pick, pick up that up. cover, the yeah. 122. The death of Gwen Stacy, 129. Man. You know, very important. Yep. Everyone knows that issue. That's like a turning point in the Spider-Man mythology, and the wedding of Peter and MJ. He did. So oh, the annual issue. Yeah. 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 So that is. Uh, an incredible it is, yeah. legacy to have in iconic Marvel comics and DC comics. Arcs were on one of the most iconic characters ever. I don't think we can give him enough love. And uh, everything I read about him, people interviewing him said he was extremely humble, always saying, well, I'm, I'm just okay. He said, I'm not a creator. I just like to add little mythologies and do mm-hmm. extra stuff to make things better. Mm-hmm. And that is why him and Stanley got along. 
Right, because Stan has pretty big ego. <laughs> well, and also want to add that I've always I think it's incredible that his son is on Spider Man. We can say what right. you want about the and new run, but how as far cool, as the legacy cool goes, I automatically yeah. loved him immediately. Yeah, I saw that. Oh yeah, yeah, his father yeah. in there. Well, yeah. someone asked him why he didn't help his son get a job there, and he goes, he goes, people to follow in their parents' footsteps, especially artists. He goes, they try to be their parent, the, that artist. Right. He goes, it always fails. He goes, they have to be their own artist. He goes, so I didn't. I let him struggle land on his own two feet. Yeah. He goes, and he's doing great. But like I, I do, I do too. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from the whole John Romita Sr. story, though, kids, is if you want a job at comics, you just go into the office and say, I'd like a job in comics, please. <laughs> and they will say, OK. You say, I've already been working for you for a year. Now you have a job in comics. There, there's other, one other little cool thing that he did that just showed how sensitive he was uh, to uh, the needs of the world and not just the fun of comics. He uh, got with a Stan and a, uh, they hired a uh, psychologist, child psychologist, to help them craft some young themed Spider-Man comic called Spidey Super Stories back in the 70s. And they put out a string of those issues that were adventure and they were Spider-Man and they were good, mm -hmm. but they had messages that were important uh, for young kids to be exposed to and then not in a pandering way, but in a really thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was very useful. Were you picking those up? I had, I did buy a few just yeah. because I like comics in general. I sure, want to read everything, sure. but you know, I only had so much money and I did pick up a few. I enjoyed them. They were very, you know, light. They were, didn't hold up to the monthly issue, but I think if you were a young boy or young girl, you it may have been. learned a few messages or things that were important. And I'm sure I got a few young readers on. Get them into started the on the other anyway. Yeah. So that was something great that he at least had a hand in starting. He, he went to a stand and suggested this and. That's also, think, right think about his peers. Think about the stable just that we mentioned between Ditko and Gene Colan and Wally Wood. And these these are just the and Sal the Buscema. Uh, these are the people that just he was. Yeah. And he and he stood out. So Hanging with those guys is uh, and he, an accomplishment. I mean, it, you were the guys working right beside them. Yeah. I don't know if you ever read this. Uh, 93 years. 93 years. That's old. a good run. Did That's you ever awesome. read the James Gunn? Anecdote? He was seven when Superman was it? I mean, that he's been yeah. He's comic, seen all of he it. He has seen it from point zero all the way through. So it's incredible. Has got. Did you read the what? James Gunn anecdote? I just read no, across that no. Day. James Gunn wrote uh, after he passed. He said, "I want to say this that I was a boy and I was reading comics and I was getting very excited by the things, the stories I was reading and and John was someone that stood out to me. He said so. I, me and my brother, sent him some artwork mm -hmm. and some story ideas that we had thought about in our little." You know, home, yeah. And and John was kind enough to write back and give some critique and some encouragement. And he said the fact that a guy who is, you know, he's one of the Marvel's top guys. He's he's supervising so much art. He's got deadlines. He's got deadlines. And then he wrote back these two young boys. And of course, one of them has ended up being a great film director with some Marvel movies under his belt. But because he was encouraged by John, you know, that's wow. just a fantastic that, legacy. What a nice guy. That is awesome. Very a Titan, and yeah. So. One of the great comic runs. Pour one out for John Ramita Sr. And one for my homie. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's good stuff. I mean, it was sad, but it's also one of those where, I honestly, again, 93 is a good run. Yeah. I you know, honestly, alive for all of it. <laughs> I never thought about it. I thought he had passed until. Right. And he's, yeah. yeah. Good. But that's cool. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it's not a horror story and hopefully he was. You know, not mistreated to where the end was. <laughs> yeah, you know, because they they've not all been. Yeah. One other little thing, going back to the kindness, is uh, he was such a, a good guy and and loved you know comics and arts and art artists that worked there and he had a fellow kinship kinship with him. And when he got into management, one of the bad things toward the end of his uh, time in management there at Marvel was he was Marvel was suffering and they they were having you know sales problems and. There was a bankruptcy looming, and eventually Toy Biz Toys bought Marvel at one point back then, but it was really uh, looking dark for Marvel. And uh, he had the responsibility of firing some of the staff, and it just broke his heart. He rejected having to do that. He didn't want to do it, but it's part of his job. And he eventually retired, and that was a big influence on his early retirement. He retired at 65, but he had wanted to stay longer, and he decided it was better to retire than to have to keep firing his friends and telling them that they had no job there at Marvel anymore. And so, I, you know, the fact that he had a kind heart, that's really reflected in that. 
discouragement. The guy really did live comics history too. Just the whole the idea of like Marvel and DC always flirting with bankruptcy and just decade upon decade and sticking with it. I mean, that's yeah, how you know. That's how you know he loved it and yeah. making it out. But that's still the story today. As far as the creatives, you hear you're like you don't do this because you're going to be a you, billionaire like you, you think. You do, do it because you love. love it. So he loved it. We love him, and you know. And we missed. Hopefully, we don't have to have another in memoriam for a good long while. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, kind of having to sw- switch gears at least a little bit here. It's good to know that Joelle Jones isn't immortal and will never die. She will never die. We I don't have to worry which, about it. I need to show you uh, later. The uh, next week's Brave and Bold has a Joelle That's Jones what story. You, did, she, did she write it as well? Yeah, it's nuts. Boy, so, oh boy. Uh, but that, I'm sorry, the end of that segment brings us to The Flash. Uh, for those of you longtime listeners know that we actually did the whole thing where we, as a store, rented uh, the theater, got all the tickets and things like that, and we went as a group, and that was actually last Thursday, the 15th, and I think it was a success. I, I had a blast. show. It was fantastic. Um, great fellowship. Great fellowship. Great convo afterwards. Uh, we clapped at the right parts. Yep. Uh, seeing, I don't know, it was just like a cool experience because most of the time when you go to the theater, you see it with people that may or may not be casual viewers, or they went because they were bored, and, or they decided they wanted to go to a movie, and they get to the, you know, they get to the box office, and they're like, uh, "I picked that one over that one." You know, it's a different yeah, type no of experience. Passion there. So we were at least in a theater full of people that wanted to be there, and it made me feel good in that sense. But then also. I have a big problem with the reviews and the way everything's going down with Flash because I'll say. I, I've i seen a few different angles and neither one of them I agree with. One of them is like Flashpoint purists, which... Oh, that's silly. Um, and then the other side of that is people that just want to shit all over it because it's a DC movie, because it's dead end, yeah. or because of CGI or whatever else. And I think ultimately... I. Especially with CGI, I understand when people are like, well, CGI looked bad. If you're going to use it, make it look good. I understand that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, everything is storytelling. If the story was good and it was conveyed, I'm like, that's and ultimately I, what matters. I, and I do think it was a choice because the the effects of, of most of it were terrific. And the, the Speed Force effects were, sure, they looked like a, a whole mind painting. I don't know. I've never been to Speed Force. I imagine things would look a little manipulated. They look a little strange. So that was fine to me. But when he was running, it's like that is probably what it would look like if you ran at the speed of light to fight crime. They never put the redshift in, though. That's one thing. They, the what's that? They never put redshift in. Oh, because he's running close to speed of light. It should phase to red. Yeah. But At least they changed the uh, lightning to yellow. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is <laughs> that? But I also, but just for comparison, I'm sorry to keep it the same. No, is no, no, no. they showed. The film, so they did the effects, but then they showed that run, like the slow motion run. Mm-hmm. And I loved the fact that when he lost his powers, he did the same thing. Was, and how ridiculous <laughs> it looked. Because it, it, looked... it let you know how hard those effects were working. Yeah. Because it was yeah. the exact same thing. It was just a matter of That's, how yeah. you got it, you know. And, and But also, I, I just want to say, like, how it, 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 people also, um, they complain. I don't think they get that this is what they're complaining about with DCU films, but they're alter driven, whereas Marvel movies are more producer driven they're more episodic so each film looks distinct they look like the project product of their creator like a patty jenkins movie looks like a patty jenkins movie a zack snyder film looks like a zack snyder film this looked like a uh this looked like a uh, annie machete film and it was moments like that like those inserts of humor that he does he has great moments of humor that like highlight the story that he's telling and that's one of them but he has great like inserts he has great reverses he has great little points that he tells that he comes back to later and it's just so indicative of Annie Machete and I think that's why he was perfect for this uh, movie it's why he was perfect for it and it too and he's doing Brave and Bold which we've yes. mentioned before which I'm excited about because I I like after seeing this I'd, I would love to see his take I on a full Batman sure. movie so I can't wait can I go back I, yeah. the, uh, the uh, CGI thing I keep hearing about that people were dis- disappointed with mm. it or if I look online I see that's one of the things that pops up immediately and it's really shocking to me because in watching the film, uh, as a fan of The Flash, maybe I just overlooked some things, but I wanted to see it uh, the way I saw it. I think maybe if you're in this, they're calling it the Chrono Bowl, uh, mm-hmm. where all the time right. uh, mm-hmm. messages are that, spinning sure. around you, 
you would not see them crystal clear. They wouldn't be of perfect. Of course you wouldn't. You, it's a speed force thing, mm -hmm. and they would be in transitional phases through other parts of time that you've been through and passed through, and so they wouldn't be I think it looks, more like, it looks more like a comic panel type thing. Yes. And then it's like, it's always, it's always, always, always the same. You have people who are like, you want, if you want to see a comic book movie, don't be shocked when you see comic book elements. Yeah. You know? Exactly. And if you, if you don't want to see that, like, then don't automatically give a bad review on The Flash because it's not the type of movie you wanted to see. Like, no. I feel like some of it's like hate watching as far as the DC sure. part of it. Sure. Which I don't, I don't. Don't you care. think it would, if they were crystal clear images of all these CGI characters, uh, wouldn't that confuse the average person who's not a comic fan watching that, that they were all there at the same time? It, some of them were supposed to be past and present and future mixing. It's, it shouldn't yeah. all be pre I wasn't uh, crystal clear and perfect. I wasn't by it at all. Um, but here's your heavy, well heavy, heavy spoiler warning now. I mean, because we're going to talk about this thing. Yes. We're going to pack it. Because, so, for, for people who have been listening to the podcast for the last several years, know that one, my favorite movie of all time is Casablanca, and uh, that I've been looking to, forward to this movie more than anything in the world, and I think it delivered. I think it is, it's, it's my favorite movie of the year. I don't know if it's the best comic movie ever made, but I could have that conversation with somebody. I could probably talk myself into it. Um, but more than that, it's, it's a movie, like, it's, my favorite movie is Casablanca because it's about living, like, your past regrets over and over every day. You're just stuck, you're mired in that, and you can't move past, you can't become who you're supposed to be because you are just stuck in the past. And we see it early. One, we see it at the very beginning with the uh, Warner Brothers shield. Like, don't get me wrong. 20th Century Fox is the best fanfare of any studio. But when you see that Warner Brothers shield, you know, you're in for something special. Mm -hmm. So it's a Warner Brothers movie. And we have Bruce Wayne, the Ben Affleck, Bruce Wayne telling him, don't live your tragedy, live your life. Like right. that's what you're doing. Look at me, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said that your tragedy made you a hero. And he said, it also made me alone. And then he gets in his car and drives off because he's Batman. And it was amazing. And it's like, wow, that's what could happen. And so he, he takes that as a tacit approval to go and fix it. And he can literally. And I love he's an past. older Batman that recognizes that, that he's listened to Alfred said, enough and you, seen all those yes, things. He's yes. been to, like, you could go back and change the past, Bruce. I could save your parents. And he's like, these scars are what Makes make what us who we are. Yeah. I love that. And, and it's like, you know, like you can, you, you don't have to be as bad as your worst day. You can move on, but you still don't, don't forget these things. Don't forget that. And, and he's young. Barry's young. He's idealistic. He's like, no, I can change this. And that would make everything better. If I can change every little thing that's wrong, in the past, everything that makes me sad, then it, everything's fine. And he tries to do that, and he sees he sees how terrible that is. But then he got, encounters a Batman, another Batman, Michael Keaton, you, you, you know, from the trailers. Right. <laughs> and that Batman, you see a Batman who has lived, like, so fast forward even more. Because yep. I, was, I was upset that Selena Kyle wasn't there. But it's like, no, of course she wouldn't be. He does end up sad and alone. Look at him. Right. <laughs> He's a crazy guy alone in an overgrown mansion. And it's like... Ugh. You, you, you just already outlived his purpose because it, his plan worked. Yeah. There was no and need. Was it. And then there's nothing left. But then ultimately when they're in that last scene in the Chronicle and he sees like, no, what, what we're doing was wrong. Like, sure, we fix things for us. I fix things for myself. But ultimately it's just because I made something right for me doesn't mean I made things right. You know, no. so he liked the ending of and I'm going to go back to this when Rick Blaine at the end of Casablanca is Another with, great Rick. And, and yes, yes. Almost as good as this Rick. But <laughs> Ilsa comes back to him, the great love of his life. That, that's what he's been wanting for. Comes back to him. And what does the Flash get to do? He gets to say, you know what? No. Like, I will get what I want and give away what I want. And Paul Henry, Victor Laszlo can go on and he can win World War II for us. And I can reset the multiverse the way it's supposed to be. And everything can go back the way it was supposed to. It was one of the great, great hero's journeys that I've ever seen. And people who are complaining about it or being like, oh, I didn't like the effects in the Chronable. Like, what? what is wrong with you? This is why. Go never have an interesting idea in your life and then die. Yeah. And that's my review. And also George Clooney. I'm sorry. Then we get George Clooney. And that makes everything even better. So it was always already a perfect movie for me. And then I got to see that telltale twinkle in George Clooney's eye and that smirk that just makes me melt. And then we're done. Like, oh, and then people are like, I give it three out of four. Like, the fuck out of here with your three out of four. <laughs> <laughs> I give it a 10 out of three. <laughs> it's good. 
that's my that's my review of the Flash. So I liked it uh, in short. It would, I so I can't believe that's how they introduced Wolverine. I mean, <laughs> immediately following, I I was conflicted partly because my son wouldn't sit down, and uh, I was distracted for half the movie because he was bringing me candy. One piece at a time. It was, it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> That's cute. That was a subplot that was going on <laughs> for the, through the flash. Well, and it got to be exciting because we're all like, oh, what's next? What's, what's he going to bring now? now what's he going to bring? Um, actually, you know what, Rick? I want to know, because you, you had expressed interest even afterwards as far as texting and stuff, that it, that it meant a lot to you as far as that goes. Like, how, do you, how did you, I guess, first of all, you know, experience-wise, I think it was half of it for you. You had mentioned that, you know, half of it was the same thing as what I had said before, like, it just felt different and it felt cool being there with, hey, these are all my guys, right? You know, so, so. often. And it was I've attended them with, you know, uh, like a girlfriend who's going mildly, nice. Yeah. You know, she's not going because she wants to be there. And uh, to be there with friends who are deeply interested, oh, like I am. Excited. I could not say how great a feeling that was. And then to be in the lobby and all of us just excited and chatting about what we had seen and. What a beautiful way, really, to see a film. That's what I thought. With your friends yeah. and, and all of us relishing what we had seen. Because the Flash movie's been a long time coming. Yeah. I, I started reading the Flash in 1957, and they had even been given the 1956 issues by my father's friends from the work uh, uh, that he used to do. And uh, they were laborers that he worked with. And uh, so I had all those early Silver Age Flash issues, and I loved Barry Allen. I thought he was the coolest and that's, I've waited, I'm, you know, I'm in my 70s now, and I'm just now seeing a Flash movie. That's a long time with to wait. Barry, not, not Wally. With, yeah, not, with Barry. And that's the weird, I was going to mention that. So Wally should have been my Flash, but for whatever reason, Barry has been. And I, 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 was, tech, I was talking to, I don't know who it was, but part of that is the John Wesley Ship Flash show. Like, that was my introduction to Flash specifically was that pilot episode. And it was Barry. So I kind of like, I just, I was like, oh, well, the Flash is Barry. Yeah. And that kind of did it for me. But also when I started reading um, Crisis um, was already kind of like legendary. So I kind of read that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so when he, when he, yeah, I mean, where he made the sacrifice and stuff like that. I mean, at that point, yes, I, I enjoyed the current Flash. But you kind of always look back at the past heroes that made those ultimate sacrifices because that felt like it was done deal. And it was for, right? gosh, decades. Yeah. So you're, there's like that reverence there where I was like, mm -hmm. I saw the show and I was like, okay, well, Barry is the Flash. And Rick, right. that was always your Flash, wasn't it? it was, always it had was. To be I uh, grew up with Wally just being uh, was Irish's nephew, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was just a fun little kid in the background and eventually got the Flash abilities. And then he started having team-ups and solo stories, and I liked him as a... He grew into it. As a titan, as a teen titan, but not as the Flash. For me, I didn't want Barry replaced. So it's hard for me when Wally was... He, well, he overcame that for me, but it, yeah, it took decades. I mean... But then on the other side of that, the flip side is if you actually want to think about it, those are some shoes to fill, and what a great job as yes. far as Wally goes. Oh, yeah, Wally. And, but, and the, Nightwing did it better, though. <laughs> Well, that, this isn't a Nightwing podcast right now. <laughs> Sorry. It's, I, know, I know, I hear you. Quit working in other Richards, but yes, he does do everything better. Richard Grayson does everything better than everybody. But even in this movie, like, he wasn't just, like, you know, he didn't just change the past or, like, something in him. He, he saw who he literally was, like, five years ago. Imagine if you could see yourself five years ago, you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I, and, like, and then that version gets better throughout the movie, that that because of I, I don't know it was just so well, the idea of like changing the past and coming to grips with who you are and well above and beyond and Matt I'm going to ask you also your opinion on this in just one second as soon as I liked I didn't feel like Barry was annoying because I knew exactly what purpose it was serving he was annoyed with himself he was annoyed yeah. with himself and the thing that leveled that out was more than likely losing his parents Exactly. Right. It's like this that is what happens the, when you're was, this is what happens and... when you are, you know, how and I love I love the contrast there. And I thought that that did an excellent job to show his range as far as like being it allowed him to show like a serious side and just be completely goofy. Like two I'll stand by it. Like I saw it in the 
in the the TV spot that they released where he's there talking to them, and then he sees him out the window, and he's doing that stupid little like dance walking across the street. Like at that point, this is the very first time you see him, and when you see the movements there, you know this guy is a clown. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's like maintained all the way through, and I love the and feel of that. Also, it was cool seeing a uh, 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 Barry Allen who would he has been like the implications that he's been in his powers for three or four years now. So he is a practiced Flash. He's a good Flash. Like at the beginning when Batman calls him, he knows what to do and how to use his powers and how to phase he can do the that that was cool just seeing a fully formed flash finally it's true yeah so i do have a complaint though yeah and i've told you this off microphone i you know i loved the fact that aquaman and green arrow and the flash were Blonde superheroes, yeah, my yeah, yeah. Entire childhood, <laughs> and the fact that they didn't have blonde-headed Flash kind of is a little bit of a bugaboo so for me. Is it is it more annoying for you because it's something so easily solved? Right. I mean, it could, would Christopher Reeve have been a good Superman if he had been a blonde? No. Or Robert Redford, like the studio wanted. It's true. Really? Yeah. No, it wouldn't work. And I love Robert. Yeah. But no, I, I get know, it's just a, I know it's a is, little um, thing, and it's petty, and but it's. You know, I grew up with Barry as a blonde, and he's never been a blonde in anything outside of the comics. You know what? It's fun. I I like Ezra as Barry, and I I like Jason as um, Aquaman. But if they make Ollie anything but a blonde guy, I will riot in the streets. See, <laughs> that I draw that's a line. Where I'm at with I the draw a line. A ah. So I think it's what it what it comes down to is how much you love, love, love V. That's character. that's true because I like Ollie more, and yes, yeah, yeah so. I accepted it. So Matt, you were also there. What was your uh, what was your take? Because I mean, I think we talked about it a little bit, and you had you took a little bit of issue with the CGI comparing it to itself. I'm saying, like you were talking about quality and consistencies yeah. is what it was coming down to, not like decisions. No, I just it it's what seven years it was in development, and we'll never know exactly what the sure any of the original cuts look like. It's a fun movie. Um, I do think it was odd to for them to come out and say it was the for DC to try to push that angle, it's the best superhero movie ever made. And that, I don't... It's good, it's fun, but it's not on that page of being the best superhero movie ever. I don't believe so. But I don't... There's so many issues I have, and it's not, it has nothing to do with that, but James Gunn, and we have no idea if any of this stuff's going to matter, or none of it's going to matter. Right. And well, and that's, I think is that's, that our Supergirl? Is it not? I mean... That's I mean, the general consensus as far as... That's one of the other things. It's like... I think part of the viewership is who cares? It doesn't matter. I did think child murder was a little harsh <laughs> with the baby shower. To get rid of uh, Cal L. I love the idea. Oh, yeah, that part. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh, he, yeah. he, he did. He just liked him so much. He, but back in time, but boy, Hitler that's style. Zod. That's Zod. Her interview boy, yeah. said that, that is the Hitler's thing is yes. Zod. Her interview said that they, that the ending scene was like four times more brutal and they cut it to get the rating. They did. Jeez. Yeah. Like it, there was, wow. Like, yeah, it was supposed to be bad, but pleasant surprise. The thing most surprising out of that entire thing is I love her as Supergirl. Yeah, Sasha Kyle did a great job. Not that I was thinking I was going to dislike her, but mm-hmm. I didn't think I was going to like her as much as I did. Yeah, yeah. For, for, the, last for Latina Supergirl, yeah. and for the small short time she's uh, on screen, I thought I I I think that's a probably good thing because I wanted more of her so yes. badly. Yeah, but I got I got my great. I mean, the the, the showstopper, the big the big musical number is uh, Michael Keaton's Batman breaking them into and out of a Siberian uh, black uh, site. It was just, it was thrilling to watch Batman problem solve, figure it out on man. the go, never ruffled, never always the one that had the answers. And you see how he keeps up with metas, you know, yep. like that's it. When you see it live action, like, Oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's almost ahead of the metas all the time. Yeah. I mean, beautiful. It it's is. not just toys. It's the man, right? No, I mean, that's the thing. It's not just the equipment, like the equipment's neat and they, it was cool seeing that Batwing again. Yeah, with, with new with, with new upgrades. new features. Yep, um, and and seeing and yeah and um, no, he's a, he's an exceptional human being. And but and then also I think it firmly puts Michael Keaton back in true north for you know who is the best Batman, actual well, Batman. And it was they everyone else is playing Michael Keaton. They utilized his chops so well. Like I thought that first scene was hilarious. Yo, yeah. When he first walks in, like <laughs> it was. He was the dumbest way to walk in on Batman. Like, they'd be like, like do you remember? Like, yes. And then the way he described, like, fights him off with a broom, like, yeah. 70 years old. Like, now he's still Batman. But then, like, oh, and he, yeah, he's not ruffled. As when these guys from another universe come in and he's like, oh, 
Yeah, well, let me explain it with this stuff I'm cooking <laughs> what, right now perfectly. When he jumps off the island, Adam, not knowing that there's any metas that can do that, and he just flies into the... I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, you guys hungry? Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, that, we kind of got a hint of the humor that was going to be in the movie by the double entendre of the baby shower at the beginning. I, oh, yeah. I was a loving that. <laughs> and and if you if anyone anyone has anything to say about Jeremy Irons' is, uh, terrific Alfred, yes. terrific... You come, you come and find me. All right, I will. Let's uh, what? Go around. Go, 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 go. Okay, go ahead. But I'm gonna go around and say favorite thing about it, and it could be anything down to casting or whatever. You don't want to? I, I'm, I'm right now. I'm uh, stuck in another frame of, of thought, and that is finish that out. I, uh, I did struggle a little bit as an old timey person who was a fan from the. New All right, so we're gonna do things we liked the least first. The least, I'm work for it. And that is besides the blonde hair, which is a little petty little thing is that um, I grew up with Flash already being a forensic investigator for the police, the Central City Police Department. Yep. He was mature enough to handle a job with a lot of responsibility and a lot of uh, yes. maturity goes with that. Yep. I, you know, I wish somehow they could have introduced a little more maturity in this character, since this is going to be one of his only films that he's ever the star of. I wish that as a, like an iconic Flash film, there had been a little bit of a hint of that maturity, that investigator for the police department. Instead Looks like someone of, murdered this sick bastard with a spoon. Just a stoner who kind of, you know, should be on a skateboard or something in the high school. It was a little bit too much of that for me. Okay. I'm being harsh, but that's my one big complaint. He just didn't seem like a guy who was going to be a good police department employee. Hmm. So, Okay. Um, thing, the one thing I didn't like about it is it was about two and a half hours. I thought it should have been about four days long. Um, they said there's 90 more minutes that were filmed. I hope hope there's at least 90 more minutes. Um, the parts I like, the, my, my favorite part is the aforementioned uh, uh, Siberian breakout, but uh, also seeing Nick Cage uh, as Superman fighting a giant cool. spider. Of course, I mean, if Which you is, know, you know. Yeah. And it was amazing. And we see how great he would have looked. Was it, uh, it's Smith, right? Uh, Kevin Smith wrote. Kevin Smith wrote a giant spider. But, but it would have been good still, despite yeah. that. Tim Burton was going to direct it. <laughs> Matt? Least favorite and you know most your favorite thing about the movie. My favorite thing I think it was the when they broke her out of Siberia. That was just fun. It's um, cool. Honestly, my least favorite is just Ezra Miller. I can't. I don't <laughs> like him. I can't stand him, and that's where I'm at. That's fair. And I mean, well, okay. The one thing I, I thought it was weird because they made him more like Spider Man, really, because the quippiness and the joking and stuff. And then, uh, then they doubled down on younger Barry, yeah, even being more annoying as hell. So. Which was great though when he told his younger self to shut up or you are, straighten up. It's not charming. It's <laughs> yeah, annoying. that was very cool. Yeah, no, it's a fun movie. It's just uh, that was my. I just don't like Ezra Miller. And for somebody who's been told many times it's not charming, it is uh, uh, abrasive and annoying. Like, yeah, I, I was there. I felt that. Like, yeah, it's okay. I'm gonna follow the rules. Least favorite thing, uh, hearing people happy about the fact that it hasn't been doing well afterwards. That's my least favorite thing oh, about the movie. I agree. Is That's the chat point. afterwards. Yeah. My favorite thing about it is I got to sit with all of my friends and my children watching a movie about The Flash. I mean, come on. About The Flash. About The Flash. The Speed Force. It's three Batman. Yes. Wow. We right there. I mean, Amazing. the history involved with it, the fact that they did everybody. Okay, there's so many. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to defend this even more. Like two weeks before that into the spider verse came out. So I was like, Oh my God, all these multiverse movies. Like, no, no flash was done first. Mm -hmm. This is a been in the can. Second of all, DC created the multiverse. You're welcome. Here's like the whole concept of it. So like, hold two different things in your head at the same time. So oh I'm God. not, and I'm not bashing Marvel or whatever else. I just, it's always a timing thing. And what goes into it is like the politics and never just like, like I'm really hoping that having a Marvel person that is beloved on the DC movies will do something for the air quotes politics involved with this. Because like, I think Matt, you'd mentioned before, like whatever, some if you can, what's to stop Marvel from owning some comic book whatever website and they can just trash whatever movie they want to and they've got a following and they can put all the money behind it and then all of a sudden you get like you get somebody telling you where you can have all of these consistent views about tons of things and be like oh we agree on a lot of this stuff and then all of a sudden you can just say this you can just 
say something and you're like, well, I usually trust them. This must be true, but it could be nefarious plot. It, yeah. Like to just get it, people it not to watch the form it. of some like vegetable based uh, uh, metrics of grading movies in, in summation in, in large <laughs> forms. And like, and <laughs> though most of those critics are in the employ of certain studios. I mean, I don't know what it would look like. That's just me spitballing. Like uh, kind of gross carrots. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, past their prime potatoes. On that topic, one of the things that really made me angry is I turned on the Good Morning America, you know, for my news in the morning, the day after we saw the film together. And we all were so happy about how the film had come out and we enjoyed it so much. I got up in the morning just a few hours later and turned on the TV and Good Morning America is running on the Chiron at the bottom of the screen. The flash film disappoints. Well, they're owned by the competition. You know, they are owned by Marvel. So mm -hmm. Of course, they're going to say that. Mm -hmm. Does that really belong in a news feed at the bottom of a screen, putting down a competitor's film when you really, it hasn't even had a chance, it hasn't even been an entire weekend, Man. you know, to see the ratings? Plus, the, at face know. value, what is it even describing? The movie itself? It's such a The broad, numbers broad that it, yeah, state. and that's yeah. how you can get away with well, it. Yeah, that's how they got away with it. I thought that was a, that was bad that was bad morally and ethically and it disappointed me a great deal that abc would do that i thought it was great i encourage people to watch it despite what you have read and from moving forward don't even bother reading if you like the flash see it if you're curious about the flash see it if you you know all of these movies these characters don't last this long because they've got nothing to say and good you know they don't have stories to tell and you also have these directors that grew up with these things, you know, and I, one thing I will say, there's a lot of, there's a lot of projects still going on and I don't think it's superhero fatigue. I think it's just a matter of like the endless negativity in the world is what's actually driving the rest of it. Outside forces. Like, uh, I mean, remember that these characters became famous because of the childlike wonder, like all the way back in the day and those people have grown up. One of those is Rick coming in and preaching it again to another generation of kids even like no this is worth your time these stories are amazing these characters are amazing they will change your life and walk into those movies with that attitude not with i wonder which movie is going to make more box office mm -hmm. that's the attitude to have with these movies and it's not and then scorsese great filmmaker but shut up we're uh, talking about different things when, i mean <laughs> now nah, when you ask I don't want mr scorsese to think that i tacitly agree with that no He's, <laughs> he can say whatever he wants <laughs> when, when you ask, though, uh, originally, what was our favorite part? For me, I, I just have to think, I, as a boy, read that book, and 67 years later, they finally make a big-budgeted film, and I see my hero at the end making a difficult decision. Uh, for the greater good. For the greater good, and it's everything you want to see your hero. I waited all this time to see this big-budgeted event, and I got paid off beautifully by this fantastic decision where the, the uh, come and you're usually a, a pretty decent critic if something doesn't have the same feel that it's supposed to so for oh. you to walk out and say so yes what, he, and like did you see like in that moment he came to terms with losing his mom like yes it's, it's, it, we have to and how it's can we just, not be touched by it'll that it'll be what's more important we'll, that feeling? she'll always be alive somewhere that, yeah it's awesome it is awesome and and you know like with with the death of uh, uh and his moment with her at the end was beautiful oh yeah yeah it brought, it brought a tear to my eye honestly as it did to the flashes <laughs> or it went uh with with the death of uh michael keaton's batman you know it's like not this time kid maybe another time it was it was great and he was like i can well, save well you and she, you already have what a wonderful it's a great film yeah it is a great film i think a plus scorsese a plus i think Martin scorsese would love this movie yeah, it was a good. I'm not picking on that specifically. I just, I don't, I'm tired of the, it's not, it's not film. He said it in one interview, and you know what? That's all it takes. I disagree, but you're Mark Scorsese. You can say whatever you no, want, he, dude. He absolutely can. I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. Craig, is one opinion better or stronger than another? You know, that's well, well when he's a much better when filmmaker one is Mark than Scorsese's, I am. It's, yeah, yeah. Gets, I'm, I'm simply taking it from the aspect of he wins out. I love the Flash and I love popcorn and I got both, so we're good. Yes, yeah, yeah. and there was some great the merchandising there at the theater with the cup and the. Yep, that's cool. Yeah. Not as I mean, it always without a doubt though, what happens is they have the different things at the different theaters and whatever movie theater I go to, it's always. The other company the other had has the, the better merch. Like, oh, I got it. Like the other Flash Cup was like, had like a kind of a transparent thing where it like lit up. Like the, With the lightning bolts? Yeah. Oh. Wow, like, I didn't like know the, They the were handing out bucket. Miatas in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I got a collector's cup. We could do this all day, though, but I think we need to 
move on unless anybody has any final thoughts on Flash. Anything in closing you want to say? Matt, Rick, Shane, we good? We're good. Tied up? DC did good. It did good. It did good, kid. <laughs> so I think that's going to move us on to uh, projects we're looking forward to. Uh, this one, there's really no... We didn't give ourselves any constraints. It could be a book that comes out next week. It could be months from now as far as solicitations, but we wanted to take the time. We did a little bit of research. Um, we didn't really take that much research. I knew what I was excited about already. Yeah. But <laughs> kind of went through stuff and kind of talk about upcoming projects to let people know what to be on the lookout for. Because, yes, the catalogs are nice. Yes, League of Comic Geeks is wonderful and all those things. But sometimes filtering through all of it is overwhelming, and we just wanted to get oh, some yeah. insight. I, I always just, something pops up, and I'm like, oh, I'd never heard of that. And I thought I've heard of everything. Yeah, it, it happens all the time, and it's hard. Matt can testify to that as far as being the primary uh, order yeah. uh, order at the store. Like, <laughs> he, Matt, Matt would really love it if you guys could figure out what the hell you want, you know, two months ahead of time. We would love it. I don't even, I don't even need two months. I no. just need one day in front of the FOC. <laughs> hot, hot girl number one. Yeah. Instead of, uh, you know... Tuesday morning at three o'clock in the morning. So uh, when it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> like, so do you have any more of those foils that you ordered six weeks ago? <laughs> yeah, I know it's my bad, but do you have one? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's just the way it goes. We're just, uh, but we just thought this would be fun also because not only are we, you know, at the shop all the time and things like that, but we're still very, very avid readers, and there are some projects that I'm pumped about. Yeah, I I found out that like half of uh, mine are yours, so. Just piggyback on that. I my mine. I have my. I have two that aren't, and one is literally next week. One is literally the last week of the year. So we're gonna cover the whole rest of twenty twenty three here. But I think what makes sense also though is kind of chronologically. And chronologically, we have to talk about Night Terrors because this yes. is. And um, it, it comes out. So we'll have, we'll have it in our hands next Thursday for a release the following Tuesday, and that's as far as kicking the books off, as far as the books starting. So these have already been ordered, but how many titles does it start with? They come out the eleventh. Okay, the eleventh is when. Yeah, okay, so we're just getting them early. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so yes, it starts July eleventh, and as far as the number of books, honestly, I haven't even calculated that out. Or actually, even had the chance to figure out a reading it's a order. It's a bunch each week, right? It's a bunch. Yeah. So, what I do know are the raw numbers, in which this is the DC um, event of the summer. Remember? The DC event of the summer, Night Terrors, and we'll do like a quick rundown and things like that. But it is it is forty three issues over the course of two months. So, I love it. It is the uh, timeless covers, as far as that pace, all over again. The um, compact nature. No, it's not going to be dragged out over a year. It's nope. And I kind of like that. To be, if I'm if I'm completely honest, as far as like putting it in two months, get it in, get in, get out, and yeah. get it done. But from what I've seen, as far as um, well, look, let's do this. Let's just run around and talk about it. So, Matt, what have you seen about it that you are intrigued by, or wh- why would you, why would you pick that book up? Ah, uh, you can say the covers on this one. Yes, you can say the covers. On this. I would look I would, amazing. Yeah, it's the covers because. <laughs> Every well, yeah. There's 43 books. Each book has uh, four covers, A through B, A through D, and then they have uh, a one in 50 or one in 100 or 125. So there are a bunch of covers, but the um, Matina covers specifically, yep, are phenomenal. Dude. So please, I was going to talk to you anyway. There's still enough time to get on there, and if you want something that we don't have coming in, I can fix it so it is here on the 11th. But you need to sit down and figure that out now. Not ratios, though. We're Not, past ratios. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> but we already got, we got a, quite a few of those anyway. Where oh, yeah, We got them all. The, the way the covers all yeah. manipulate the heroes, uh, some nightmarish version of each one. And then you've got people like Dead Man or Zatanna or Constantine who are already dabbling in the shadows. So The supernatural horror part of it yes, is interesting because it's well, away from the traditional sci-fi. Dead Man action. is finally getting its due. And I know people who've listened for years know this, but... Uh, for for new listeners, I do have a first appearance of uh, first Dead appearance of Dead Man, which you've been reaping the the benefits of that. That book's been on, it was on the hot list for a good two months for a long while. Yes, anyone knows me who knows that my personal investments are always sound. <laughs> Don't you also have the Zatanna? Yes, I do have a first appearance of Zatanna. I just didn't want to brag. <laughs> it's uh, I read them both. <laughs> I've also got a first appearance of DC's Blue Devil. Everyone, so man. The hits just keep on coming. <laughs> that's right. was, uh, and Zatanna in the Swamp Thing TV. That's series. right. Yep. There's a the Zatanna 
book for night terrors does have some of the nicest covers yeah, those are my of favorite. the entire my favorite. collection. They're just beautiful. I have, I have to say, though, to highlight one of my most exciting, the idea behind it, we'll see as far as execution, but this will be the time where we can talk about a general overall um, synopsis as far as our understanding, because we've gotten very little so far. It's been a free comic book day, like whatever, half issue thing that's been released. So basically the story is going to be that dead man and Batman team up to discover like he's the, he's the tour guide. Right. So there, there you go. There's number one. What, what, what more, what else? The other thing is everybody else. What is the villain? Is it insomnia? Is that the name or is yeah, somebody um, so, Yeah. Um, sleep, sleep, something uh, with sleep. Yeah. So basically everybody's stuck like in a, like a living nightmare type thing, or they're stuck in a nightmare. So that is, you know, with Batman, which is a Batman book that involves the death of his parents and some crazy like design I've seen of like a bat that has a gun that's like part of it exactly. coming out of its mouth. Send like that. some crazy like horror, beautiful design thing, which I think Mora did, which the thing that's really blown me away with this is Amora, it looks like had a lot of the designs and he does not strike me as a anybody that has any horror demons. Guy, He's like the sweetest right, guy. Yeah. That's, that beautiful, beautiful, peaceful farm. Like if person. you sat down across from him at the lunch table and he found out that something had gone wrong, he'd offer you his snack pack or half of his banana. Like Seriously. a sweetheart, right? And then he'd remark the peel with, here, oh, who's your favorite hero here? Right. Here he is. Like just, so that's part of the allure. Um, the Doc Shaner cover. Yes. The, I've always, seen always as, like, terrific. Ratios. One of the best there is. Um, so oh, then, But also, Doc Shaner, also very light, very... 56 suit for Shazam. And then, and his yeah. stuff works perfectly with the darkness. It looks fantastic. But so each of these books and the spinoff books are each of them, the characters, and by each of them I mean like Harley Quinn, Punchline, um, Green Lantern, Detective Comics, Wonder Woman. Like it goes on and on and on. That's why there's so many titles. Pretty much every Frank. everybody is getting their little nightmare thing. And one of those is Joker. And I know that. Somebody cares about this or at least is paying attention or has a sense of humor because the Joker book is about his living nightmare is so it's about him having a desk job. <laughs> so like the covers I've seen of the Joker books are like him on a subway on the way to work. Like what would him, Joker's him, nightmare him at a desk reality with like, be with like a world's greatest whatever <laughs> cup, right? Or like a just a little cup full the of man pencils. in the gray flannel suit is Joker now. That is that's such a great conceit. And that already tells me that they're at least thinking, and I would not be surprised if that ends up being my favorite book, no matter what fantastic best things idea. happen. Yeah, yeah, it's already the best idea. But like, if you're gonna pick and choose these, like for those of you that aren't looking for getting the you know running the full table on these, I would at least you know look at the Joker one just for something that is silly. Or, but also when I say that, there's a mainline Night Terrors. Like there's first blood and there's just regular night tears. Yeah. That's so that's going to be just Your like regular six issues, event, event stuff. Event stuff. But picking up the ancillary ones, I'm just, I'm looking forward most to, honestly, uh, Poison Ivy, Zatanna, yeah. uh, Joker, and probably Batman from a story perspective and Superman from a design perspective. That's a good yeah. And I think like for for titles that right now are superb like like Poison Ivy or Batman, I think they'll only benefit but titles that maybe aren't do, like green green lantern so far is underwhelming to me but i think the night terrors will give it a creative kick and yes. i hope that's what it does uh you know line wide i i agree something needs to happen in green lantern <laughs> plus it's my first and seventh favorite superheroes of all time teaming up i mean that's that's awesome well, i've only read issue one of the new series but i thought it was great <laughs> of green lantern yeah no it is but nothing happens in issue two is the problem so it's like okay it's well, on my nightstand i'll i'm just waiting night. just waiting for something to happen yep I, going back to scorsese again if i can by all means i <laughs> what's that film where the uh boxcar bertha no that's great barbara hershey love that whoa but uh you can't get Rick. You can't. You can't. And it's not great. The, but uh, I like that you like it. The, uh, the guy who gets trapped downtown with a uh, oh uh, after hours after hours oh, after hours man. is the Joker book, more or oh, less if you think about man. it. That's cool. Yeah. Go out and find it, everybody. That is a great, great movie. Great film. Uh, you know, it started out as a Tim Burton movie. Oh, it did yeah. He was so early in his career that when then he heard um he heard that Scorsese had an interest in the script, so he said, "Yours, Mark Scorsese, you can have it." It's one of the best films I've ever seen in my life, and to this I, day, I think I could watch it a hundred times. Absolutely adore it. And, and it's you got know, the monkeys and Cheech and Chong. And in Cheech and Chong. <laughs> and Cheech and Chong. Wow. So it, it is That's so royalty good. right um, there. You know, and you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna 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 
parry that right now into Night Fever. Because okay. After Hours and Night Fever, the book by Ed Brubaker that me and Craig read this week that is absolutely superb. Yep. No no uh, surprise, it's Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips in their latest non-reckless uh, uh, entry. Which was the purpose. Right. They kind of talked. They were like, like, let's do something not reckless, but thing. still together. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, both both of them have this very, like, a uh, very straight man. It's very, it's very uh, uh, Hitchcockian in that, like, this very average guy gets... In over his head in something that he doesn't doesn't like it gets out of his hands and he is it he is at the uh, mercy of events you know yep. and in both of them they take place at night in uncharted territory this is downtown uh, Manhattan I think um, and then it's Europe some European country yep. night fever and it's both of them are about both of them that was at Philip's request he's like Can yes. you give me some architecture I'm familiar <laughs> with I like, know it was awesome but both of them are about seeing like we all know that there are things going on at night. In places that are cooler than you, darker than something you'll ever experience, weirder than you can ever experience, you know. And this, both that movie and this comic is about like, oh shit, there it is, right there. Uh, the the main character, I can't remember, Rainer is the is the, mm-hmm. the other guy, but yeah. the, our main character is a uh, bookseller. Yep, and he's on a, a book tour to sell books at some convention. Like a promoter, not yeah. like anything no, cool. No, like no, the guy, cool. Yeah. He, he's successful. But he's not. He he doesn't like his life. He's bored. No, he's bored. And he goes out walking at night. Uh, he blows off. He's I'm going to blow off the convention. I don't care. Mm-hmm. He gets drunk and he's walking the streets at night in Europe in this in this and cobblestone he town. Accidentally gets involved some stuff. He well, he like. sees something and he's like, you know, I'm just going to keep walking. I'm going to mm-hmm. follow that. And then he he goes to this. We'll call it a party. Mm-hmm. And it is it is. But like it is some underworld weirdness going on. And and it is awesome. It is thrilling. It is scary. And it's like yeah, all those things that I thought exist and now i'm part of them then he finds out that's probably not good i am not a creature of the night yeah it's it's great it's cool um yeah which so, that one you can pick up right now i mean it we've just got, came yeah, out it night, just came night out. fever by ed brubaker and sean phillips the superstar duo behind uh uh reckless captain america America's. civil war um oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah Reck- the reckless books uh just years and years of good good work he, he was one of my top five writers but if you watch uh Scorsese, Scorsese film, you'll be afraid of paper mache and empty oh my, bottles. That's that's the paper mache is how you'll get to work. You, they'll just throw you out of a car and <laughs> that's know. crazy. Just remind when you mentioned the Joker book and how it was unfolding, I thought of that film right away. And that well, why there was can't a I think Scorsese of his name? Connection. We'll see. Griffin Dunn. Is Griffin Dunn. Griffin Dunn. It'll be a, Jesus. I, I I just I think it's going to be a good time. Like Night Terrors is the big deal. It's taking place over July and August, but you're in and you're out. So chronologically, if you're looking for something nearby, that's something to get on in on. Make sure you do pay attention to all of the covers. This is one where the covers are very, 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 very fantastic. There's even some. I even got intrigued on the gimmicky covers on this one because oh, they yeah, did they too. did like they added after the fact even like a, a cover E like neon ink yeah, type yeah. thing that they added on where. I'm sure they're going to be either glowy or whatever else, but and you may not be into that stuff, but I personally am because it reminds me of my childhood. Like I love when I when I see one of those gimmicky covers, is I'm like, oh okay, I'm ten again, which I love it. So I'm into that stuff. So check those out. Um, and chronologically, I guess because we haven't cleared it with everybody else, I think Matt, do you have the next thing that's coming out? Because my next one is August second. Oh, I no, I was. You oh, guys, I, th- I say we just go. Yeah, just go yeah. because I. What I want to do is I want to talk about the FOC for the following week. When okay, we're done. Um, books that I ha- books that are coming out that I want to read though. One comes out next week. Sure, it's the oddly pedestrian life of Christopher Chaos, which is written by Tynan. Yep, it's his new book. And it, it's com- See, I didn't know that. Completely flew. I know Jeez. because we looked at the polls today when we went through the orders and nobody was aware that this book was coming out nope. at all whatsoever. Nope. Nope. Like. I've got it pulled in, I think, one other person. Wow. And it was like, this is a Tynan book, guys. You're like, oh, it's a Tynan book. So we'll sell out, but yeah, <laughs> not ahead of time. <laughs> it looks, uh, yeah, it definitely looks interesting. It's Oh, and as a side, for those that um, get the Mandalorian comic uh, yep. from Marvel, it's a new uh, season two, number one. It's supposed to be volume two, number one, but season two, number one came out this week. And they did not roll over in your League of Comic Geeks. So we went from 15 polls to three. So what I did was, is if you didn't continue it, I threw an A cover in your box anyway, in case you did. And that'll remind you to oh, actually add it to your poll. 
Yeah. So we can figure out how many we actually need because that those numbers didn't roll over. So sorry. No, no, no. And even specifically, just in general, the same thing's going to happen to Wonder Woman people. The same thing's going to happen to just to keep an perhaps yeah. just a reminder yep, to yep, 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 people yep. who pull dynamite books should know this by now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After sure. six, it's it restarts no matter what title it is. Yep. Um, did you have another one or was it Sacrificers uh, by uh, Reminder? I read that. Yeah. First one. It's good. That looks it's very good. It looks fun. I love his weirdness and his goofiness mm-hmm. and they come together. It looks really well. Mm-hmm. Art style on that one looks. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, that that one is a release of August 2nd. Yep. So it's still. I bet there's going to be an absent father in this. Just spitballing? Just... Um, maybe. Call me crazy. Uh, oh, Sacrificers? Yeah. Well, no. it's Reminder. Tomorrow, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, I actually I actually wrote these down in case you want me to do it. I'll read it. It's tomorrow is a harmonious paradise thanks to five families who make everything perfect for the price of one child per household. Now, as that bill comes due, a son expected to give everything for a family that never loved him and an affluent daughter determined to destroy utopia must unite to end one generation's unnaturally protracted reign. It sounds like, but it's not like humans. It's like a it's humanoids. It's That's humanoid God, type thing, like... and it sounds. I read like the first issue for uh, the free comic book day, yep. and it's I can't wait for the yeah for it to start. Like that one was one that I was definitely definitely looking forward to. Um, Remember, always gets on base for me, um, like Fear Agent and Black Science, and then one like I'd never read Scumbag because I thought I rolled my eyes. I thought I understood the premise. Finally, read the whole thing in one go. Yep, just terrific. Yeah, yeah. so it's good. Uh, Side note: If you guys have listening at home have never read Death and Glory by uh, Rick Remender, that that's the one I suggest you pick up and. Read. That, black science another great too, right the black, black market, science is my favorite but the black market uh <laughs> yeah yes yes but uh black science is you know uh, like 45 issue whereas death and glory i think is like nine or ten you yeah. get in and get out so yep the, the theme of the day is great ricks and we had the greatest rick here the greatest rick yeah right uh oh i'm sorry before i forget because we're I'm talking about future something that's currently going on but leading to a future is Everybody pick up Ultimate Invasion. Ultimate Invasion by Jonathan Hickman and Brian Hitch is a... The number one issue came out this week. It's four parts, and this leads into a one-shot, which is leading into relaunching the Ultimate Universe in only the way Hickman can. And that first issue was... I'm a fanboy at this point to where I don't know if it's good or not because, I mean, I know it's good. But I can't really rank it as far as where it goes. First of all, because it's one issue with Hickman. Like, it takes at least, you know, 70 for all secrets to be revealed. But Right, but he's... what? So I've read, I've read the last 10 years of Hickman or whatever, and he is... This is... One, he came... I thought it came to a satisfying conclusion, and usually I'm, I'm against it when something does that, and then we relaunch. But with Jonathan Hickman, I realize you're smarter than me. You're smarter than everybody. And I'm reading this first issue, and it's oversized, um, and it... It's our. It's still mining stuff that he has planted, thirty issues back, twenty issues back, ten issues back, and it's so brilliant. And it's so like the way he tells it, you're just like, oh, of course, that story was never done. It was always planned like this. It's so great. I cannot wait to see where this is going. Well, and I feel like I don't know how to describe this. Marvel gives him like a special pass to allow Absolutely. things to, but allowing like, like this is pretty. There's some pretty grotesque stuff in here that you normally wouldn't see. That I haven't seen in a Marvel book recently, at least. Like things like, uh, just like gross things. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I see. Um, and, and well, also just the high concepts. Yes. But here, you know, they're going to pay off. You know, it's not going to just get. There's not going to be any things left dangling. It's it's all for a reason. It's all for a purpose. So, for those of you, I can say this because I have not read them. I have read Hickman, but it's not like you have to have read Hickman, and I have not read Ultimates. Um, the yeah. ultimate universe stuff. You can just pick this it up. Is here and you are okay. It yeah. is a jumping yeah. on point. So don't be intimidated by not knowing but it. How great of a storyteller can you be where you're tying in something from 23 years ago and something from the last 10 years and it's something that you can jump on right now? That is Jonathan Hickman. That yes. is a rare, rare bird. But in also the fun part is, is come in, pick up this book, and we will be more than happy to talk to you about the last 10 years of Jonathan Hickman. Absolutely. And Craig, you are working through that now. And I'm, you are. How, how are you feeling about it? It is... So if I'm completely honest, and I'm sorry, Rick, don't hate me. I think I've said, I've told you before anyway. I've never much cared for Fantastic Four. I just, it's been one of those things where I started with X-Men, and I felt like Fantastic Four was less interesting. You and I got into a physical altercation in the parking lot when Chris told me that. That's just where I was at. 
However, I'm not going to go as far as to say that they're my favorite team, but I absolutely positively love Hickman's run because he understands what those characters should be, do, do who they've you get always it been. Now? Do you get? I get it. It's yeah, the problem. Yeah. The thing is, it's like this. It's the same thing where I just have to. I, I just had to put in the work as far as doing it. Like mm-hmm. if you say, "Oh, Fantastic Four is great," it's like, okay, I've said that. I've heard that multiple times through multiple decades. I mean, different decades. Even it's not like whatever, whatever, whatever. I've tried multiple times. I'm just like, it's just not my thing. I don't get it. Like this whole cosmic thing, like Galactus and. Silver Surfer and all of that. I'm just like, whatever. I don't care. But Doom, I've always thought Doom was amazing. Yeah. Doom is what like my the favorite part. Four? The Frightful Four? Yeah. I, I don't know. The I don't Wizard, it, Trapster, <laughs> yeah. Medusa. No, no. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But I mean, my long story short, because I'm not going to go into it. Yes. I care about the Fantastic Four. I feel like I know what I always should have been getting out of it. And it is that fantastical part. And it's like... It's the fantastic, like when Civil War was out, I preferred Annihilation. It's not the cosmic thing that bothers me. It's just that I feel like Annihilation was telling a better story than what Civil War was on Earth. And I feel like Hickman's Fantastic Four was telling a better story on every Earth and all the stuff that's involved with it. And it's it's been kind of hard and mind-blowing because we are also currently going through East of West (sighs) in book club. And my only thing I will say is a drawback is you can't you can't just read Hickman books as like a passive activity. It is an no. active activity. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of active, air quotes, reading books that I'm currently doing because for East of West, it's already hard enough. Like, uh, Matt, you read it in single issues. So did you just read one and then when two came out, read one and then two? And then no, when got, three I, came I, out, you did one, two, and three? Because I <laughs> keeping I, it track of it is... I got lucky. I agree. I, uh, I agree. Somebody turned me on to it, and it was already 15 or 16 issues okay. in. Okay, yeah. But that, that just made it great because I went, I literally have like eight or nine A covers of issue number. I mean, I have a bunch of them. So I you went great, searching and you just bought all of them. Well, yeah. whenever I see one at Half Price Books or wherever I go, I would grab it. It'd be a couple dollars, so I have a whole bunch of those. But I... It's just good stuff. It's fantastic. Because you've, you've been singing that book's praises since we that, met, even. Yeah, it, as far I mean, as... it is one, it is... It's my top five. It's like the first comic book, yeah, we talked about. It. Yeah, it's my top five all time. I just love everything about Jonathan it. Jonathan freaking Hickman. Man. Yes. Yeah. So you take that imagination, and you even even when you put constraints around it, I feel like there's not really a boundary for Jonathan Hickman and, and, as far as editorial and, and or the. That's rest the person that Marvel's like, here, have this, have it all, just make it good. Yep. So, long story short, going back to the original thing, Ultimate Invasion, read it. You won't regret it. Great jumping on point. It's it does have a future. Hickman is launching Ultimate Universe again. I mean, think about that. It's going to so, be incredible. Yeah, kids who read uh, uh, Ultimate Spider Man in high school, and that that was so many people's jumping on point to comics. And he's he entered that he entered that universe. But and the ending of this first issue, coming. especially for those people, are going to be devastated <sighs> at the end of this first book. I'm I'm being serious. I am not exaggerating. Like if if Ultimate Spider Man was where your jumping on point was, and that's your boy, Peter Parker, yeah, oh boy. the end of this book is going to be. But like, if what? you if you also think that Miles Morales is effortlessly cool, you'll like this too. Exactly. All right. Who's got a book? What are you guys excited about? Um, I got one also coming out. Um, I think next week. Uh, Fish flies by my my second favorite living uh, comic writer by Jeff Lemire. Yep. Yeah. Up. Um, I I can't wait. I'm I'm into it right now. He's doing Bone Orchard. Uh, the mythology with uh, Andrea Sorrentino, and this is this is getting back to his uh, with stuff that he's writing and drawing. Yep. And that's that. People say his art isn't for everybody, and yeah, you know, I, I guess not. But I, I love it, and usually his stuff that he he writes and draws goes right for the heartstrings. And yep. you know, my heartstrings are always wanting to be tugged, so I, I can't wait. It's gonna be another one of his uh very personal, very you know, if you've ever read like Underwater Welder or Sweet Tooth or. Uh, Essex, Essex County. County. You know, you know that he can, he can, he can get right to the the heart of the human character. And since we're all mostly all of us are human, um, <laughs> th- when that gets you, when he tries to, when he wants to, few of us maybe scrolls, scry, yeah. that could be. Um, but when 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 he understands the the human humanity and he understands what what moves us and what hurts us and what makes us sad, and I think Fish Flies is gonna be all that. If you've not read Royal City, actually, no, I, you know, keep, read all Lemire's books, but Royal City and Descender are are maybe the two maybe the two that do those the best. So like I, he's never written anything that I didn't think was great. Like, at, like great. 
Mm-hmm. And I think this is this is the start of another great run. I'm one of those that started you you have to read the marriage of his words and his artist, you know, the actual artwork in order to I don't even some people will admittedly identify with it. I was not one of those people where I saw the oh, music. Yeah, once saying. you know that he is marrying his own they, words they do with the pictures, other, and yeah, they really do, well, they really are one hundred percent a complete package. I agree. I agree very much. So it's very great. Much. Um, and then I'll just go my other one, yeah. and I'll just pick. So the the other book that I'm looking forward to is the. It's at the very end of this year. It's it's like the second or third week of December. It's called uh, Where the Body Was by the aforementioned team of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, and I don't know what it's about. I've seen the cover. It's it looks like the one. It's it's one of the best covers I've ever seen. It looks like the the best pulp. something. If you see a pulp novel, if you've ever seen pulp novel covers, this has this has them all beat. It's something that you would immediately pick up and page through just on the art alone. Uh, it's so it's so it's so like hardcore and so like a hard boiled. And again, that team, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, they've never done anything that wasn't great. Um, so pick up Night Fever if you love Night Fever, which you 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 should. <laughs> this is something to put on your poll for the end, uh, end of the year. So. It'll at least give you a reason not to kill yourself before 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, do you have anything? I know you don't pay as much attention as, you I'm know. pretty superhero-ish, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I have to admit, uh, because of my interest in sci-fi and action heroes from my youth, I love uh, Hot Girl, and I think it's coming out the 16th of July. Yep, Hoping Hot finally Girl getting her own. Take off. She has well, the Joe Kubert uh, designed helmet is, is the best mask or helmet of any superhero ever. Uh, is there is it Kubert drawn that book? I didn't even bother looking. No, How cool would that so. be? I don't think so. You know where he's got I'm that. I'm flashing back to the original yeah. version I read in the Silver yeah. Age, where she was a Thanagarian Andy. police officer. And I, I, yes. if nothing else, Rick, you and me can geek out over that every week. Because boy, I can't wait for that. I'm excited. Yeah, but and I have I'm, to mention for Kubert going back to Vermita. Kubert's are in three generations now. Did you know that? Yes. Um, because one of Joe either Andy. Andy or whatever's daughter is in yeah, industry yeah, now. Yeah. Which oh, is daughter. that's three oh. generations of you comic know, love. I, I, I just lucky. found out that Jenny Frizen also went to the Kubert Art School. Oh. Yeah. That makes so. sense. That's cool. Yeah. Huge talent and, and really influential in my early life, that artist. Yeah. So I yeah. They don't think I heard that his daughter was that though. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. We're in the third we're in a third generation book, Kubert. Whatever it is. Yeah. I can't wait for the the hot girl though. Awesome pick. Yeah, I think that'll be fun. That would be even if it's not Erica Schultz, right? If you could somehow get a Joe a book that somehow was signed by Joe and have it signed by all three generations. Can you imagine? That's a project, man. <laughs> But anyway. Yeah, and the Remedias as well. That's yep. amazing. Very cool. Great talent has really benefited our hobby. Um, our th- art. The next one I'm going to talk to as far as relating now from a timing aspect so people actually might have a chance is uh, this week was Wonder Woman 800. And it was great. On the shelf. It was wonderful. Yes. So the first three quarters of the book are wrapping up pretty much what has been going on. But... It's kind of anthology in the way that the same story is done by multiple artists. Mm-hmm. The first, like, five or six is Joel Jones. Like most milestone issues, yeah. Jaw-dropping. The fantastic. First page, buddy. Wonderful Yara Floor <sighs> art and just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff. But the end of that book is the Tom, uh, the King and Sam Pierre, the kickoff. The new creative team. Leading into the new creative team into Wonder Woman number one, which is coming out September 19th. So. Huge. I was excited before, and now that I've actually read it and I've seen like the design work that's been done with some characters in there, because I don't want to ruin it for anything, and then, um, I don't know, they introduced Trinity, which if you don't know who Trinity is, you have to read to find out, and you have to understand where that name comes from and things like that. There's already little breadcrumbs where I'm like, yes, let's do this. In just like eight pages. Yep. He got me on board. Does the work. So uh, the solicitation is for Wonder Woman number one, but I'm saying this, like I said, Go buy 800 to now because it's out, and that leads directly into what, where Wonder Woman 1 will start or kind of work towards. And that is, after a mysterious Amazonian is accused of mass murder, Congress passes the Amazon Safety Act, barring all Amazons from U.S. soil. To carry out their plans, the government starts a task force, the Amazon Extradition Entity, to remove those who don't comply by any means necessary. Now, in her search for the truth behind the killing, Wonder Woman finds herself an outlaw in the world she once swore to protect. So... That sounds Boy. like a cool, like a cool Tom King idea. Yeah, and she's gonna be like all alone. But this is gonna work from 
number one to where this, whatever happens in this 800 is going to make more sense is what the promise is. So that the end of 800 is like, what? And it's cool. Um, so Wonder Woman one, I think we were all already excited. We've talked about it multiple times. Yeah. Tom King. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait to be buying a Wonder Woman book, I like being excited for one each week again. Every week. week. It's going to be awesome. But, and also this, this 800 issue though, um, four stories each featuring one of the, um, legacy characters from Wonder Woman, uh, cause Yara Flora, then Donna Choi and then Cassie, Cassie. Sandsmark, which yep. is awesome. And then we get introduced to tw- Trinity. It, it is a great work on its own. And it's Becky Cloonan's last work on her for now. Jen Bartel did Jen interiors Bartel. on it. Yeah. Oh, the, it every, awesome. every yeah. issue was so gorgeous. Yep. Each story. Yeah. It's good stuff. Then, uh, you got anything else, Matt? Yeah. Um, I'm going to help you guys finish up or I'm going to give you some of the titles that are coming out in the next few weeks so you can get onto the FOC and order those if you like them. So coming up soon, you need to get on these because these FOC will have passed when you hear this for these first books, but big game. Number one, it's a, a Mark, uh, Myler universe. Uh, every, so all the stuff he's done yes. as far as the independent work, it's a shared Kick universe. Ass, Kingsman, Nemesis, Magic Order, everything, it comes together in one book. That's cool. It looks awesome. And then um, Astonishing Iceman, Death of Venomverse, Venomverse number one, and Magneto one, same week. That's cool. The following week for FOC, uh, Batman Beyond Neo Gothic number one, Poison Ivy Uncovered number one, which is a one shot. The new Sandman book, uh, special, it's a Thessaly book. Getting that. Yep. And then Superman, Last Days of Lex Luthor. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. And then the following week, there's a couple more titles that are new. And Captain Marvel, uh, Dark Tempest comes out. Uh, Children of the Vault comes out. It's a a Miss Minutes one shot. That's cool. And then we have the Ghost Rider, Wolverine, uh, The Weapons of Vengeance, Alpha, number one. Sick. And then we have Immortal Thor, number one. And those are the biggest yeah. books for the last, next couple FOCs that I dug through that might help you. Which, if you... He got that book purely off his work on Immortal Hulk. Ewing did. Yeah. So okay. it's, uh, it's looking cool. That could be cool. Yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, long-time listeners, I'm no Mark Millar fan. But if you are, that does sound... That crossover does sound pretty amazing. Is Nemesis... Well, of course, it would have yeah, to be. Yeah, Nemesis, Kick-Ass, oh, good. Kingsman. He would have to be. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but there are those who like that. No, I mean, who knows? Who knows, right? I mean, never, never had better writing on bathroom stalls. Sorry. Well, <laughs> come on, man. No, nah, it's it's fine. So that sounds. I mean, it's cool though. Like the shared universe stuff is pretty neat, as far as like because if you even I do like that he has so many successful titles of his own that he, he can, can make, make that universe. That is very cool to me. I I do. If you tried my, reading any of them, though, it's he'll write four, five, six issues of something and then come back to it ten years later. Yeah. Like they're all ongoing, but he'll only write one of them. You time. know what everybody's been loving of his recently is that, the, what's that $2 book? The Night, whatever, what's it called? Oh, God. Night Shift? Yeah. Whatever it is. Night Shift. Like, whatever. ninety nine. Yeah. It's the cheapest book we sell. But it's like, huh. but it's been, it's been, it's already it, in third and fourth image printings. Book? Yeah. Wow. Image book. Two bucks. And like, I think he's subsidizing the rest of the cost himself. He just wants it to get out there. But at very high reviews. People have loved that book. So he's figured Hopefully out the, that's uh, part of it. He's figured out the uh, ingredients that make a, Successful book, I guess. Yeah. Um, they all taste bad, though. These, <laughs> these, these next two I'm lumping together because they have the same writer, and I'm kind of on board with uh, with uh, this fine artist as of late, and that is Kelly Thompson of uh, Black Cloak fame, and she just wrapped up her run on Captain Marvel. Great. She is releasing an independent uh, creator-owned called The Cull on August 16th, which that is... Um, she's already won an Eisner, Ms. Kelly Thompson has, and... Um, Matea D. Eulis did work on Captain America. Beautiful artwork, regardless. Uh, team up for their first creator owned work together. Something is killing the children horror vibes mixed with Goonie style adventure as five friends set off to shoot a short film on a forbidden, forbidden rock near their home the summer before they all go their separate ways. But that's not really why they're there. One of them has lied, and that lie will change their lives forever. The cold sounds, sounds, sounds great. Very interesting to me. And, uh, like I said, that's a, she's been doing uh, Black Cloak and Captain Marvel, which the Captain Marvel run is a fantastic run. Great run, and Black Cloak came out of nowhere and yep. punched us in the neck. Been killing it. It's been awesome. The other book, which I was super excited about hearing, and this one is even more recent as far as the announcement, is she is bringing back, she's coming back and doing, she's doing Birds of Prey. And it yeah. comes out September 5th. And for those of you, it's been controversial, I guess, whatever, um, as far as who she chose. So 
uh, Birds of Prey for her lineup, which it may change. You know, she could she can do whatever she wants. She's writing the book. Um, Black Canary leading along with Cassandra Kane, Big Barda. Oh no! Yes. Oh yeah, yes. I, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. So Zealot last week. and Harley Quinn, like the controversy being, I hate great awesome things. Because that is awesome. I want to see. I want to see a bromance between Harley and Big Barda. Barda, right? Barda and Harley in the same room. Man. Yes. <laughs> I'm. I can't wait. But so like uh, Diana trying to keep it all civil. It so teamed up with her. Uh, so Hawkeye. I'm sorry, Leonardo Romero. Like the art style looks like it's fantastic and it looks very very cool. And then colorist Jordi Belair, of, of course, alongside uh, letter Clayton Cowles for an electrifying I mean, series. Yeah. So that's I already take squad. Kelly, Kelly Thompson, which has been killing it. You just named a bunch of characters I already love that are now a team. Now a team with the best group of talent, one of the best groups of talent in the business. This that's Tom King, Dan Sampier level. Yeah. Like I can't wait for Birds of Prey. Come and on. yeah. So that was the definitely. only controversy is if they didn't have Black Canary. Everything else is Yeah. But they do. And then they have a bunch of more awesome. Like this is gonna be a great book. And she's leading it. Black, um, Black Canary. The only thing that make it better is if we get a Frank Cho uh, cover. Wait uh, a second. Yeah. Talk about a work of we art. We definitely will. Isn't that a wraparound cover? Yeah. Forget it's it. It's fantastic. Forget it. I'm there. Uh, I'm going to keep it the DC theme, and then I'll switch over to some other stuff. Uh, I'm also looking at Fire and Ice. Welcome to Smallville, which uh, Can't September 5th wait. is when that's coming out. Uh, for those of you that haven't read Fire and Ice, you need to. If As recent as Human Target, you would at least have some exposure to yeah, them but and then the backup story in um power girl yep but Which, power girl's also involved in this like it's all right but if you read that power girl issue the fire and ice story was the good part yes so we're really looking forward to this <laughs> so this is the solicitation and this really hooked me on this okay. so things could not possibly be worse for fire and ice in beatrice da costa's professional opinion superman sent the former justice leaguers packing for smallville following an extremely public and utterly disastrous mission that was all Guy Gardner's fault. Thank you very much. <laughs> and in doing so, doomed them to their fate to a fate worse than death. Irrelevance. Ice finds herself drawn to the quiet life and dreams of planting roots, but fire, fire will do just about anything to get the heck out of Dodge and back in the hero circuit, including challenging the DCO's biggest villains to a knockdown drag out live streamed brawl in the streets of Smallville. A I'm like, and it keeps going. Like the concept of putting those two. In this town, this is and, and Ice comes to terms. She's like, "Oh, this oh, is yeah. nice." I, I and like Fire's this. like, "Bullshit, it's you, nice." You can already um, imagine Ice like knowing the name of all the like the owners of the shops downtown. Mm -hmm. Beach. <laughs> it's being like, sweet, What's the biggest. Uh, yeah, I can't wait. And also, this this is my beloved uh, Geffen and McGuire and Demetrius is Justice League. The one in twenty five. I was telling you specifically, McGuire has the one in twenty five cover on that first one. And you I are going. Pull it. I gotta pull you, it. Yeah, yeah. It, you're gonna want it. Remember so. when I frightened him at uh, Chicago Comic Con? I I don't. <laughs> With your I enthusiasm. Think, yes, 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 yes. Well, I, I, I don't. I, he didn't really believe me. Matt had to tell him, like, because I kept telling him how big of a fan I was, and he seemed skeptical. Like, you're being like you were a troll. Like he's one, you know, the, one of those assholes that comes up and talks about how they're such huge yeah. fans that they're just being oh, mean. I love you. Yeah, Matt had to be like, no, no, no. He, he's no, not he, lying. He's <laughs> he's telling the truth. No, yeah. he loves your work. <laughs> that was great. Um, but Fire Nights, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm super pumped about that. Uh, Matt already talked about sacrificers. Uh, I'll uh, honorable mentions for September coming up. Predator versus Wolverine. That just sounds like a good time. It's awesome. Uh, cup, you know, Ultimate Warriors against each other. And I found out that uh, a new Captain America run by Straczynski. Yep. I'm not going to complain yep. about that. Yep. That sounds like a Great lot of news. fun. Um. Oh, another independent. This is recent. Um. So those of you that. Had been on the Void Rivals train for the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal because it was Boy. kind of kept secret. Uh, Image now has the licensing for Transformers and GI Joe, and the Energ Void Rivals takes place in the Energon universe, which is for both of those books. But in particular, for personal preference, um, I'm more looking forward to Transformers side of things. In October fourth, um, Transformers One releases, and it's done by Daniel Warren Johnson. The perfect match for that That's material. Great. And perfect it, match for it. It is insane. Like, even just like the cover art that they've showed as far as his Optimus and everything, it is incredible. So, solicitation is Optimus Prime is supposed to have led the Autobots to victory. Instead, the fate of Cybertron is unknown and his allies have crash landed far from home, which you know that if you read Void Rivals because. Yes. 
you know, you see that everything's all spread out. So they've thought about it here. Um, alongside their enemies, the Decepticons, as, these, as the Titanic forces renew their war on Earth, one thing is immediately clear. The planet will never be the same. New alliances are struck. Battle lines are redrawn. And humanity's only hope of survival is Optimus Prime. Fa- I mean, I, I love the idea that, like, he, so he's coming. This, Daniel Warren Johnson, he, he just wrote and drew Murder Falcon. Mm-hmm. Then he wrote and draw, drew do a power bomb. Yep. Then I assume he, like, smashed a Red Bull can on his forehead. <laughs> And he was like, Hit Transformers. Cat. And it was like, let's do Transformers. It's, it is going to be amazing. I can't wait. Yeah. And then Williamson is doing the G.I. Joe book, the Duke book, or the Cobra Commander book. Crazy. Yeah. So there's some big names there, yeah. involved in Transformers and G.I. Joe right now. And then for those of you that just saw the movie, the very end of the movie, uh, the we, most recent we, one. We said spoilers, guys. Yep. The very end of the last one was announcing that the Transformers just recognized crossover. G.I. Joe for the crossover. Crossover. So it was also a lot of fun. They're going everybody's going all in as far as that goes. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. These are just the ones that have been on my mind where I lay there at night reading books where I'm like, man, I'm wondering how good these upcoming books are gonna be. The future is bright. Yeah. yeah. These are all exciting. Right jumping on point. Yeah. Yes. And all of these are um I think we kind of and you naturally do this. We kind of went out of our way to pick things where you're like, these are excellent jumping on point books. Like there's obviously new arcs coming out and things like something's killing. The children is coming out very, very soon again oh, yeah. with a new arc where, um, that's obviously great. We're halfway through world tree, which is fantastic, but these are things more or less where we're giving suggestions of jumping on points. Cause we also know, you know, swiftly moving stream and it can be intimidating, but these are all good jumping on points, night terrors. I can't even tell you how excited I am. Like DC was like, let's do horror in summer and take over in everything of summer with Dead Man and Batman. You're yeah, like, the okay. whole brand across the entire brand. Yeah, team up Batman and and Dead Man. I can't wait. And it has a little bit of for me has a little bit of a Doctor Strange vibe enough that a Marvel fan should maybe give this a try if you're hesitant or haven't been because it's gonna DC get lately. weird. Yeah, it's gonna get weird and be very much like what you're used to in the Doctor Strange books with yeah. Nightmare or whatever. Yeah. It looks good. I can't. I think the last time that Batman teamed up with Boston like this was Brave and the Bold. So, yeah. Oh, there have been many series, but still, this is going to be great. Speaking of which, uh, Brave and the Bold by it. That's can't also wait. a fantastic can't anthology wait. book that's out right now. Rich issue, issue one was terrific. Two's even better. Boy, I'm saying it, claiming it now. But with that, uh, I think we're going to wrap things up here. We appreciate you guys listening in. And uh, go see the Flash, everybody. Go see the Flash. Rick, anything? What else? Matt, we'll see you next week. <laughs> Which we will have next week. We are actually working with uh, Leanna Kangas of Know Your Station. Which is who we'll be interviewing. <laughs> so, awesome. time to reread all those books again this week and prepare. Right. We got to give roll out the carpet for that. Uh, looking I really forward to up. talking with her. So, right. we'll see everybody next week. Thank, Thank you. you.